Welcome to My Autism Tribe, a community of advocates that are linked by autism but bound by strength. This is a time to find our sounding board and shoulders that help us carry life's load without the fear of criticism. We give and receive. We nurture and empower. I'm your host, Susan Scott. Nutritional deficiencies are a common issue for individuals with autism and ADHD, in addition to food sensitivities and intolerances. Nutrition is important for everyone, and sometimes even the correction of a single deficiency can create dramatic improvements. Today's episode features guest Denise Voigt. She's a clinical nutritionist with a Master's of Science in Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine, specializing in nutritional intervention for autism spectrum disorders and ADHD. Her passion for nutritional biochemistry for the past 20 years emerged from her own son's struggle with ADHD. Now, she uses her expertise and compassion to help educate, empower, and support families affected by autism and ADHD. Hey, Denise, I want you to tell everyone, really, because it's such an eye-opener. Can you explain to everyone what functional medicine is or functional nutrition and why it's so important? Absolutely, absolutely. So functional medicine is sort of a field of medicine that's that's growing quite rapidly, actually, where we look at the whole body as a system. So they talk about it being a systems biology approach um, and also an evidence-based approach. So what that means is that instead of just looking at each system in like it's compartmentalized, like you go to a pulmonary guy for your lungs, you go to an ophthalmologist for your eyes, you're looking at all these individualized specialty care, instead of looking at it like that, we look at the whole body and how the system works together. So how hormones Mm -hmm. all talk to each other and how each system is connected. Like I'm sure you've heard the whole gut brain access and how they are connected. Mm -hmm. So instead of just looking at one system in isolation, functional medicine tries to look at the, the broader, bigger picture, how the body works in unison and works together. So functional nutrition takes that and, and we really talk about more of the nutrition aspect and how nutrients and nutrition all affect our biochemistry throughout the body, how we can heal and upregulate the body's own ability to do what it's supposed to do with nutrients and supportive nutrition. So my field in particular, we look at at what's called epigenetics, which is how nutrition and nutrients affect your gene expression and how we can mm. change that gene expression by eating particular foods, changing some lifestyle choices, sleep, stress, those kind of things. So again, it just kind of wraps around, we're looking at the whole body as a system and how it works together. You, we've all heard this, your, your body is like a machine. And if one thing goes wrong, it's kind of like, you, you know, you being in a factory and if one little cog gets loosened or whatever, it throws the entire factory off. So I guess functional medicine is kind of like getting all of those different specialists, the, the pulmonary specialists and all of that into one single room and really having conversations with all of them at the same time. Right. And what we see is amazing results from that because you, there, none of our systems work in unison or it, are compartmentalized. When when something happens in one system, it, it, there will be a downstream effect or an upstream effect in another. And when we start recognizing that, we can use this information to help us rather than mm-hmm. hinder us. So, but when we isolate things and, you know, we mask a symptom with a prescription, that kind of thing, it, you know, you're just isolating that one little function sure. and no one's taking into consideration all the other stuff that will happen down the line. So in functional medicine, we try to, we try to incorporate it all and look at the, the broader, bigger picture. So that's really cool. Are you saying, and this is going to be a really stupid question, I'm sure. So I apologize in advance, but are we are we born a specific way? Are we is our footprint already created with this nutritional, I guess, DNA? Or you know, I guess lifestyle changes can affect that as well. Like if you eat McDonald's every single day of your life, of course, that's going to affect your body in a certain way. But are we kind of predisposition to certain things? Sure, sure. Okay, so that's, I love that, the way that you asked that. So, yes, we are predisposed to certain things, and we get genetics passed down from our parents and family genes, but our genes are not written in stone. So that's where epigenetics comes into play. We can turn on or off gene expression, meaning what that gene instruction gives to our body to produce or make or however you want to put it. We can offset that. We can change that. We can support it. We can, we can do lots of different things through 
nutrition and lifestyle. So like you said, if, if you, let's say you had some genes that predispose you to uh, diabetes and cancer or some other things, and then you go and eat McDonald's every day, you're going to promote those that gene expression for mm. diabetes or whatever. But if you promote, you know, you eat a healthy lifestyle and you get active, you know, activity, you get good sleep, you have stress management, things like that, you're going to promote those genes to be um, not expressed, if, if that makes any sense. So it's a little bit tricky. And of course, it gets it can get pretty, pretty detailed in the, in the discussion. And we're just going to try and do a cursory here. But I think you can wrap your head around that. You know, if, if you support the, the good genes and try to, you know, squash the, the expression of genes we don't want to be expressed, we can, we can live a healthier life. So I was recently at Barnes & Noble, and I, am, I can get sucked into that place like no other. And <laughs> I was in the aisle of all of these nutrition books, you know, and how many diet books do we see on the shelves? So right. really, it's like what amazes me is that what you're saying, it's, you know, our biochemistry, all of our bodies, if we're looking at it at a molecular level, how is it possible that any one book can be used for anyone, right? Right. And that's, that's exactly the point. It can't. So one of the terms that we use a lot in functional medicine is bio-individuality. Mm -hmm. And what that really means is that each individual has their own individual biochemistry. It's kind of like how, how now we can prove uh, criminals uh, through DNA and that kind of thing, because sure. we all have our own unique individual biochemistry and one diet might work for one person, but not another. And so as a functional medicine nutritionist, that's my job is to dial it in and try to help people figure out what works for them. And just because one diet works for one person does not mean it's going to work for someone else. And it is very individualized. And there are a couple things that we can say that overall, okay, this is not good for mm -hmm. anybody. Um, but for, for the most part, I mean, some people, I, uh, I do food sensitivity panels quite often. And it's surprising how, you know, one person's poison is another person's treat, right? You can, sure. you can be sensitive to something as healthy for you as, you know, a fruit or vegetable and someone else, you know, it, it, it's, everybody has their own individual needs. So the key is to figure out what works for you. And so all those diet books on the shelves, they got there because they worked for somebody, like somebody yeah. used that diet protocol and it worked. But in my line of thinking where I'm at, I am, I'm never rigid or so set in stone on any one diet because and, and here's the other the other part that makes it even more complicated is a diet may work for you for a short short time and then your body starts either adapting to it or sort of rebelling against it or maybe it doesn't work anymore because your situation has changed. Maybe you've moved to a different environment. Maybe you're getting less sleep. Maybe you have a more stressful job and that particular eating plan worked for you for that short time but now it doesn't. So I try to tell people, don't be rigid and set in stone on any one particular yeah. diet, right? I mean, of course, we have the overall, the overreaching, like, oh, you know, everybody knows that, you know, eating a whole foods, uh, you know, limiting your processed uh, foods and high sugar foods and artificial sweetened foods and all these things, that generally is good for everybody. But, sure. it, you know, it can get far more detail, especially when we start talking about our kiddos with autism. Yeah, definitely. Why don't you share about that? Because I know that I've I've read so many different articles about how important nutrition is overall, and especially with kiddos or individuals on the spectrum, and how some of the deficiencies really kind of roll over into some of the overall symptoms of people with, on the spectrum. So Absolutely. how does one kind of even begin that process? You know, it can get, it can go from zero to complicated really quickly, mm -hmm. right? So the, the so I always start first with the big, huge overall picture, which is nutrients are required for the body to function. Period. That goes for every single one of us. Now we know that individuals on the spectrum have some issues with detoxification. They have some gut issues. Um, there's some neurodevelopmental delays. There's there's particular biochemical imbalances in that that population of individuals. So mm -hmm. it's more important for us to look at the nutrients and the things that support those particular 
biochemical reactions. So we've seen that it's quite common for individuals on spectrum to have deficiencies in things like B6, B12. Um, a lot of them have issues with methylation, which is another biochemical process. So they're unable to what we call methylate mm -hmm. their vitamins or their minerals or their processes. And that could get a very complicated story that we probably won't get into right here. But the, the end game is that we need to support these biochemical reactions in their body. They're unable to do it on their own. So we need to work even harder to make sure that these kids and these individuals are getting that that nutrition and those needs. So, you know, things like vitamin D, carnitine, zinc, magnesium, these are all vitally important to many biochemical reactions and even more so in our individuals with autism. So when we can support those biochemical reactions and those nutrient deficiencies, we can see amazing results in um, improvement in behaviors and symptoms and mm -hmm. things like that. So each population, like autism and you know neurodevelopmental disorders, they have a particular need for extra nutrients. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, it's very difficult. I, as a nutritionist, I, I know from this end and working with these families, I, I currently have a client on my, my docket right now that only eats pretzels. That sure. is the only thing he will eat. And we know not only does this individual need more nutrients than, say, a neurotypical child, but for him to only have pretzels, this is a real problem. Like yeah. this, you know, how are, their brains and neurodevelopment are happening so rapidly right now at that those young years um, that they need those those nutrients, and not just our kiddos on the spectrum. I mean, if you look at what we're feeding. Uh, the children in America today, mm -hmm. um, those fluorescent gummy thingies that, you know, say there's fruit and there's not a, not a, an ounce <laughs> of fruit in them, yeah. um, go-gurts and Lunchables and all these things that, that are not food. These are not nutrients. And we treat our, our kids like they're little mini garbage disposals that they can just handle boatloads of sugar and coloring and chemicals. And they really cannot. And our kids on the spectrum, and I also work with kids with ADHD, they're highly sensitive to these chemicals. So um, the, the chemicals in artificial colors, flavors, sweeteners, preservatives, they're very, they're hard for them to process. So they'll have, you know, increases in some unwanted behaviors, hyperactivity, brain fog, th things like that, mm -hmm. simply from this food, and I say the word food loosely, um, that we're feeding them. So we really need to up our game and start giving our understanding that nutrients are what makes the body function. And these kids need extra nutrients, not extra chemicals and stuff. If, if you had a car, you put gasoline in the car to make the car go, right? Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't put anything other than gasoline in your car to make it go. And if you had some high-end Lamborghini fancy car, you're going to put the highest quality, highest octane oil in that car possible. But when we have our kids and we just see these fun foods and it makes them happy, so we end up feeding them this junk, this stuff that is not nutritive. And it's, it's not only is it not nutritive and helpful to their bodies, it actually is detrimental to their health and, and we're poisoning them is basically what's happening. And then we stamp a label on them and say that they're hyperactive and they can't learn and mm -hmm. they're in trouble at school. Right. But, you know, we're the one that fed them the pop tart on the way out the door. That was full <laughs> yeah. of all this artificial coloring, flavoring, sugar, and absolutely zero support for the brain. And then we expect them to sit in school and, and have a good time learning. <laughs> so, and you know. so it's kind of a two prong approach, really, because what you're saying is for individuals on the spectrum, not only at the molecular level are they deficient in some of these nutrients, but then also because of these problem eating behaviors, then they're also deficient in some of just the regular nutrients that a neurotypical child may be getting in their every day day yeah. diet because exactly so, right. I think it's a fear of mine at one time my son had like three different foods that he was eating one of them Chex Mix um, one very particular brand of baby food pouches and then they changed the font on the pouch so he would no longer eat that and mm -hmm. um, so it's a fear of mine when someone says, you know, you need to be getting these types of nutrients into your son's body, and yet he just wants Chex Mix. How in yeah. the world? And I remember the first pediatrician that, or uh, one of the first pediatricians that I took him to, you know, she was telling me, 
Susan, you just need to fix what's for dinner and then close the kitchen. It's done. Your son will eat at some point you, when he's hungry. And I, I, I did this for, it was a little over 24 hours. My son did not eat. And as a parent, my gosh, the feeling, right. the pit in your stomach that you have because your child's not eating, I just couldn't do it. And so how do you begin this approach with families, with children that have these special needs, autism, ADHD, how do you even begin that process of getting the nutrients into their bodies? It's, it can be challenging. It, mm-hmm. And it is, you know, each individual case is a little bit different. So we kind of go with, you know, how their family works, how, what the child's issue. Sometimes it's a texture issue. Sometimes because it's a sensory issue that they don't like mm-hmm. crunchy or they only prefer crunchy. Or like you said, some of these kids, like they see a different color package coming at them and they're like, no. And so yeah. we, we really just have to take the individual for where they're at, first of all. So when my son was young and uh, we had to put him on specialty diets, I just remember I just remember being completely dumbfounded like well what am I supposed to feed him because everything on this list that you told me that we're supposed to exclude is the only things that he eats so the struggle was real and it really what I try to tell people is it's baby steps Mm -hmm. don't try to come in and just clear out because that's what I did like I made that mistake I cleared out the kitchen I cleared out all of his favorite foods everything that I was told he should not have no gluten no dairy no soy we had he had issues with food coloring and all these things so I got rid of everything all at once and it turned into a major event like he was having fits and wouldn't Mm -hmm. eat anything and it it was hard. So I learned the hard way that it, the slow and go approach is much easier. And with after working with families, you know, just trying to make small little changes at a time um, is the best approach. But that being said, these kids need these nutrients. So this is where um, I decided it was really important to formulate a mm-hmm. multivitamin and mineral supplement for these kids so that we could try at least to get that minimum level of nutrients sure. in them. Um, and after working with doctor's offices and seeing these um, biomedical doctors giving these specialty supplements, which were high quality, high grade, high potency, you know, not the kind of stuff you would find in a store. Um, and they were very expensive. And yeah. many times these doctors would prescribe multiple supplements so by the time the family's walking out the door they've got hundreds of dollars worth of supplements and you know five or six different bottles and they're like what am I supposed to do with all this and how am I supposed to get them to take it and da, 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 da. Sure. so this is where we formulated our own product and based off of some research and some clinical trials so a, a clinical trial was performed and published last year mm-hmm. um, on individuals on the spectrum with a high potency multivitamin mineral supplement and a gluten and casein free diet also soy free actually and they saw improvements across the board in many different autism rating scales and other things improvement in speech um, improvement in development so they offset their developmental delay it was quite an impressive study Mm -hmm. and when I saw that study it just gave me the whole you know what we need to get this kind of information this kind of formulation out to everybody this should be accessible to not only families who can have access to biomedical doctors and specialty care and can afford this Mm -hmm. whole process of supplements we need to be able to get this out to everybody because after working with some of these families and these picky eaters or the sensory issues that are stopping them from eating a wide variety of healthy foods we've got to get these nutrients in them one way or the other as a nutritionist my first preference is going to be through food always um and but sure. at the in the meantime let's support their biochemistry and see if we can offset some of these imbalances and help them function at a physiological level better it's not about giving them drugs or di- we're trying to help their own body upregulate its ability to do what it's supposed to do and you cannot do that without nutrients right so that's where the super spectrum kids is sort of my side project that um, I have a partner in and we sort of developed this company called super spectrum kids and um, right now it's just it's a multivitamin mineral supplement with a few other active compounds that have been shown to help with detoxification mitochondrial health things um, neurodevelopmental um, support things that really help 
these specific individuals um, on the spectrum. And so th- the goal there was to help offset what they're not getting from nutrition, although I will 100% always argue that don't give up on nutrition. You can't always just replace real food with supplements. That's that's not what I'm saying at all. Yeah. What I say to people is, you know, you, you want to try your hardest to get those foods in, but I'm not an advocate of when people say, oh, well, just don't feed him it. He'll eventually eat. Some of these kiddos, if you've met them, no, they won't. Yes. <laughs> they they will put their line in the sand and they will not eat. <laughs> so yeah. trying to fight that battle and just say, well, fine, I'm not going to feed them anything until he eats this. That's that's not the best approach. And many times, the, my I think the thing I probably say the most that I should probably have a banner made is to my parents that are working with their kids on the spectrum and trying to make changes in their nutrition. Do not get emotionally involved in the outcome of trying to get them to to try something new. If they don't like it, it's okay. You can either try and introduce it again later, try and introduce it in a different format, cut it different, slice it different, present it different, let them play with it, let them touch it, let them lick it, keep it on the counter. Just start exposing to them to it slowly and don't get emotionally invested in the outcome. Don't, you know, don't get upset that they don't like it. And I, and I'm saying this, you know, I'm not trying to be brazen because I've been there when you go through all this trouble to make this specialty, you know, yes. zucchini bread. Mix been there, done that. Free, dairy free, and you, you, you went through all this trouble and then you give it to them and you're all excited that, oh, look, I, this is all the things you can have on, on your diet, blah, blah, blah. And here you go. And then they look at it and they don't even want to try it. And they walk away. (laughs) And I know that me saying, don't be emotionally invested, sounds like, you know, I haven't been there. You're like, good luck. Yeah. (laughs) I've been there many times. But what I tell people is, you know, just you got to fight the good fight. You are your child's best advocate when it comes to all this stuff. And you just have to be patient. And it's hard sometimes. It's not easy. It's very difficult. But it is very worth it. Because you may have to kiss quite a few frogs before you find that prince but eventually you will find stuff that works for your child and it's not an easy fix it's not quick it sometimes it it takes months before a child will actually put this new food in their mouth and consume it and and eat it and and it's hard and I I can relate and I understand and so I try my hardest to give those different tips and tricks Mm -hmm. on how we can do this I mean I don't go from oh hey he likes pretzels. Cool. Let's just transition him into a head of broccoli. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I, I've been around nutritionists that do that. And I, I just look at them like, do you really expect that to work? Like, how? Oh, sure. <laughs> and happen. even portion size. I think it, someone yeah. said, start off with, you know, if just like for the grain of rice, you know, size sure. on, on the plate and then move into like a pea size. And that yeah. sounds like just a grueling process, but if it's going to work or if they yeah. have to lick it 200 times before they actually put it in the mouth, yeah. then it, you know, that's fine. Now, and I know this sounds crazy. That just sounds, it's, you know, some people are like, what? I don't have the patience for that. Or, I mean, it could be as simple as I had uh, one client who, her child started eating things, but with a toothpick. So as long yes. as he could poke with his toothpick and put his mouth, he had a good time with that. And he would he would try lots of different things, but only if it was presented on a toothpick. So sometimes it's a matter of being creative and mm-hmm. and knowing your child and paying attention. You know your kid better than anybody else, and you know what kind of things they like or or get excited about or don't get excited about you got to try to work the system (laughs) sure absolutely whatever it takes exactly and denise i know that i've looked into several different tests you know when alex this was several years ago the doctor had recommended us going through to see if he had any food and sensitivities and it came back that he didn't that you as far as the gluten or the casein whatever you know everything was fine but Really, if you're going into the really molecular level, I know there are some companies out there, um, Spectracells, one of them, where they kind of look at, gosh, a lot of different vitamins and minerals and really kind of takes into account how well your body's absorbing them, if they're absorbing them at all. And then Mm -hmm. what do you do with that information? It's like, okay, because these tests are expensive, 
They and can be, yes, they can so, be. So SpectraCell mm-hmm. in particular is they have a micronutrient testing, so we can see the actual nutrient deficiency. So if um, your child is is deficient in, and it does, I think there's maybe 40 some odd nutrients that it looks at. So that's helpful to see exactly where those deficiencies are. So we can replace mm-hmm. those deficiencies by supplementing or increasing a particular food that is high in that nutrient. But mm-hmm. many times um, what I find as well is some of these kids have very sensitive gut systems. They perhaps have some leaky gut and other things and inflammation and digestive issues. So even if they are eating a healthy diet, they might not be a absorbing those nutrients well Mm -hmm. and this is something we really need to know because again falling back onto that bigger picture the body requires nutrients to function you know our body is made of so it goes like this you got your cells right Mm -hmm. so at the cellular level cells together make tissues tissues together make organs organs together make the body but if you look all the way back down to that very tiny cell if that cell is not functioning properly then it's a disturbance in the force we can't have good tissue we can't have good organs we can't have good body function so we have to really think about wrap our brain around the cells that require nutrients and are they absorbing those nutrients are they able to utilize these nutrients so some of these tests are are can get very expensive and now we have new genetic markers that we can test we have food sensitivity panels you can test you can there's i mean there's pretty much a test out there for every And I try to tell my families not don't get overwhelmed by all that. Let's start with the basics first and support normal biochemical reactions and see if we can make improvements there first. Mm -hmm. Um, All the tests are nice. Having that empirical data and and support to show that there's a deficiency or to show that there's an imbalance, it sometimes makes parents feel better, um, you know, having that solid evidence. But for the most part, a lot of these tests are not necessary, right? So you could take a food sensitivity test and it could show that you're not sensitive to any foods but that just means that your body didn't have an immune reaction to the protein in that food it doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's fine so i say this to all my families about the gluten and casein thing because that obviously that's the one we hear about the most right gluten Mm -hmm. casein free diet um i also like to plug in the let's put soy in there too and one of the reasons is is that these are highly inflammatory foods so wheat uh gluten and casein and uh Soy, they're all very inflammatory and so they contribute to leaky gut they contribute to you know the broken down partially digested proteins that result from these foods mm-hmm. can stimulate the opioid receptors in the brain so children actually get not even just children actually everybody can get addicted to these foods and yes. especially when they're not digested completely they can cause real havoc in the system so Mm -hmm. when i i always start my families and try and tell them like you're not going to lose any nutrients or benefits if you get rid of gluten and casein i mean the truth about cow's milk is Mm -hmm. you know cow's milk was meant to make a little baby tiny cute cow calf into a big old fat cow it's full of growth hormones and you know insulin like growth factors and all these things that help that little baby calf grow really big and really fast so you know we don't really need that in in our lives and the inflammation that comes from it and the ability to digest it and all these things are rough and um so for the most part i try to tell my families you know if you can get rid of the gluten and casein and soy that will decrease a lot of the inflammation and disturbance in the gut and everything else um but it's very mm-hmm. difficult. It's a lot easier nowadays than it was when my oh, son was young. I'm because sure. There, there weren't these products on the market. But with that, I like to put the caveat, just because it's a gluten and casein-free donut does not make it healthy. <laughs> you oh, know? sure. You, just because it's gluten-free does not mean that it's not high in sugar or could they could have added extra artificial colors, flavors, sweeteners, and things to make it taste better. Other other things that we don't want our kids to have so really I guess the first line of defense is to learn how to read your labels and understand what ingredients are in these so-called foods and be very mindful of what you're allowing you know in your your kid's body it's it's you know we really need to just start prioritizing their health and what's important and as fun as it is to have a little ho-ho or a cookie or a snack pack you know I don't remember last time I saw a three-year-old throw on her purse get her car keys go to the store (laughs) and buy herself a bunch of craft food 
right? Sure. <laughs> that's, that's not how it works. That that's on the parent. And as as much as I know the struggle is real, but we we have to stop feeding our children these non foods, these toxins, these poisons, because it's only breaking down the system even worse. Yeah. Wow, that's such great advice, too. And uh, there are so many times that I feel like, you know, we all have mom guilt or parent guilt. You know, it's like, my gosh, it's been (laughs) it's been one of those days I'm going to go through the drive through just because I don't even have time to to fix dinner. But I know that I'm really going to make a really bigger effort just to make sure that Alex is getting the nutrients. And of course, we do all kinds of different, you know, food plays and stuff at the table. Not every single night, but we try to. But I would love to talk to you even on, you know, a different platform at a later time, too, about Alex and his nutritional deficiencies and things like that. And I know that anybody else that may be interested in speaking with you, you know, they can go to denisevoigt.com um, and, and check the information, your bio and everything and the podcast information. So for yeah. anyone out there that wants more information, please contact you and would love to continue our conversation at a later time as well. Sure. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Denise, and uh, best Thank of luck. Thank you so luck. much for having me. You're- you know, I, I, I love it. I, I love when people are interested in hearing about nutrition. It's, you know, it's where my, my passion is. I want to help everybody spread the word about how it, very important this baseline, overarching reach that nutrition has. And so the more that we can get everybody to understand how important it is, the, the better off these kids are going to be. Nutrition is the core modality of functional medicine. Instead of focusing on an isolated set of symptoms, it addresses the whole person, like genetic, environmental, and lifestyle factors. As researchers continue to explore and speculate on the reasons for the rise in autism, may we continue to educate ourselves so that we may be better equipped advocates for our loved ones. Thank you so much for joining my autism tribe.